Okay, so let's let's start with this lecture. Okay, today we're look, tonight we're looking at exclusion clauses. Alright, so this is a particular kind of a contract clause. Alright, so we basically look at how we identify. Alright, so exclusion exemption is the same thing. Okay, so don't get confused with the, the same meaning. Just that you can use them interchangeably, exemption clause or exclusion clause. Alright, so you need to be, first you need to be able to identify identify um, what is an exemption clause. What does it look like? What 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 elements does it contain? And what is its effect on the liabilities? Alright, because here exemption clause only relates to liabilities of the part, contracting parties. Then we will look at what are the common law principles that apply to exemption clauses and also in terms of legislation. Right? Unfair contract terms at UCTA right, is a very relevant legislation statute relating to uh, exemption clause. So this is what we're looking at tonight. Okay, so first the effect. Alright, so let's look at the Hosbury. 80.099 Okay, so as S as, uh, as is obvious from its name, it just wants to exclude liability or exempt the party from liability. Okay, so effectively what it means is that even though I did something wrong, I'm not liable. Alright, so either it is excluding or restricting, right, limitation. So it's either it can be exemption 100% or it could be up to a certain limit. For example, you might say, okay, even if I, I breach a contract and cause you damage, limited to uh, $2.50 or whatever, okay? Or you could say that uh, you park your car here at your own risk. Any damage, I'm not liable. That's an exclusion clause. Alright, so these are these are uh, basically examples. Okay. Any questions about that? I think you have all basically come across in day-to-day -day lives. Right, all the small print. Right, sometimes you will see the small print on contracts. Or you will, if you have a ticket, car park ticket or whatever ticket, right, then you will see reverse side. And there are all these little tiny ones, cannot see one. So right, you will say you are not responsible for this, not liable for that. Okay? So that's what it is. Exemption cost. It can be called exclusion clause, can be called exception clause. If it works, then the party in breach, right? So this is the party in breach. The party who has breached the contract, who has done something wrong and caused damage, that party not liable if the exemption clause is effective. Okay, that's the bottom line thing you must remember. Right? The, the party who is in breach and causes damage, he's not responsible for it. Right? Because that clause works. Right? So in that case, right, then it's very important to see how how do we determine whether that clause works. Right? Or it could be limitation, for example. Huh? Like I said, it could be limited to ten thousand dollars. Alright? If I if I breach contract, cause you damage only up to ten thousand, not more than that. I limit my liability. Alright, so as you can see they have quite important critical impact on the contracting parties. So therefore it's important to know to understand how it works. In what circumstances does it work? Okay, so like I said, this is a very good example. Cars are parked in this car park at your own risk. Right? This you 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 park a car you you have seen this everywhere. Management shall not be responsible for any damage caused to any vehicle while it is parked in this car park. 
right? You have seen this before, okay? Sometimes they may be written inside the car park, sometimes written outside the car park, sometimes it's on the ticket, alright, whatever. Because okay, so nowadays your car park is just a sensor on your IU, right? So it's mainly, is it, do you see something outside or inside? Okay, and this is an example, a limitation clause. The liability of the laboratory in case of loss or damage to any film sent to us for processing is limited to the replacement of an equivalent amount of film. Meaning, if you had a very important, uh, valuable content on the film, I'm not liable for that. I don't really care what's on it. Okay, I only limit my liability to the cost of the film. Right, so if you don't have that, the other party can come and claim, hey, you know, all my shooting costs, all my production costs, and everything. Right? No. So all that is out if your limitation clause is effective. So three rules. Okay, this is something you must remember. Three rules. First rule. The exemption limitation clause must be part of the contract. Okay, so we'll look into what do we mean by part of the contract. How is it not part of the contract? Okay. Two, it must be very clear, plain, easily understood. Right, so the reverse side of that is what we always say it must be unambiguous. It means cannot be cannot be understood in a different way, reasonably misunderstood. So it must be very clear, very plain, very clearly understood. Finally, it must not be prohibited by law. Right, so even if you have something that is part of the contract and is clear, but if the law doesn't allow you to exclude that liability, that clause is ineffective. Right, so you must have all three. Well, it's not one or the other, it's all three. You have all three, then you have an effective exemption clause. One is missing, not effective. Okay, so let's look at the first rule. Or sometimes what we say, the clause must be incorporated into the contract. Okay, that's another way of saying it. Or part of the contract. Okay, so let's go back to Horsbury. Alright, so what it says there, the first criteria must be part of the contract. Alright, so as it says there, the court must be satisfied that the particular document relied on as containing notice uh, of the excluding or limiting tr term is in truth an integral part of the contract. Right, so the onus is on the party wishing. Okay, so this one here, when you say onus, uh, what do you understand from that word onus? Have you come across? The onus of proof. Uh, yeah, kind of. So it's kind of like the onus, the responsibility to prove. Alright? So here, the responsibility to prove the 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 the, the exemption clause is effective is on the person who's relying on it. So it's like that, right? So if I'm the person who 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 committed the breach, caused damage, and I'm trying to say I'm not responsible, then I must prove all these three things. It's not for the other party to prove that it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? It's not for the other party to prove that the clause does not comply with the three uh, the three criteria. It's for the person who is relying on the clause to prove that it does comply. Okay, so this is very important in terms of when you're in court, right? When you're in court, because it's onus of proof. It's sometimes quite difficult to prove a certain thing, right? So here is a very positive uh, uh, obligation on the person relying on the exemption clause to prove. Okay, so how then can you show? So then we go into 101, 102 and so forth. Signature. 
Alright, so in the absence of fraud or misrepresentation, if the, the rule is that a person is bound by terms of a contractual document which he has signed, even though he has not read his contents, and whether or not he understands the language in which it is written. Okay? Alright, so as long as you sign, you're bound. Right? Who asked you to sign? You don't need to sign. Alright, so always be careful of anything you sign. Right? If you are signed, if you have signed a document, you are presumed to be bound by it. Or you presume to have agreed to have been bound by it. Okay. So, for example, for example, even if you have signed uh, a, a normal contract which did not have that clause in it, then later on, right, someone passes you a document. Hey, can you also sign this one because there's an extra clause in it? Then you, for whatever reason, didn't read it, and you just sign it because you know you just thought, okay, I'll just sign. But the rest of the contract you read, but this one you don't sign. Then you did something you don't read. Right? Then, well, shock. The biggest shock you'll get is when you finally read it and say, Oh, you didn't tell me or I didn't know. Too bad. Right? So as we all know, there's this famous thing going around with Simlim, right? Right? So even though it's very unfair what is written in the stupid contract, but the, the tourists sign. The tourists sign. So the moment they sign, they are bound. Even though it's a ridiculous cost. Right, the warranty thousand dollars, whatever it is. Okay, so don't sign until you are you are read, you have read carefully what you have signed. It's always a very cardinal rule. Read first before signing, no matter what, and before understanding. Okay, so that's one way. One way you can show that it's part of the contract. If there's a signature on it, then you can say argue, it's part of the contract because you signed it. You sign it, and we say agree to it. Okay. Then once you, one, that's one way. Then the other thing is about if, if you have a document containing terms which have not been signed, all right? There's no signing involved. Then it's a question of reasonable notice. All right. So there's one. There's different different examples. Uh, Okay, so notice is usually the biggest uh, issue because signing is very obvious. Okay, so for example, it says that if the party receiving the ticket did not see or know there was any writing on the document, such as a ticket, he is not bound. These are no signature. Just remember, no signature involved here, right? No signature. So for example, but right, if you paid for something. Right, then you get your ticket. You pay. Then you get a ticket. Right? But that's before you pay. I mean after you pay, sorry. Then you start looking at it and then you say, Why are all these conditions? I was not told about this when I paid. That is actually not notice. No notice actually are not bound. You're not bound. Right? So in the old days or even nowadays uh, when you go to a car park, for example, uh, where when is the contract when is the contract close completed for a car park? Let's say now car park. You drive when? Huh? When you enter the gantry, now no ticket. <laughs> okay, let's say. Okay, sometimes you have, but let's say majority, right? So when you go in, right, and the first up, right, they will they will flash something. And you go in. So that is actually the contract is concluded then. Okay? Right? So then you go in, you get out of the car, then you look on top, there's a big signboard inside that says the usual thing, management not responsible. Is it effective? Is it effective or not? Have you been given notice before or after the contract? Yeah, it should be before. So it's actually after. So that is actually ineffective, you know. Huh? No, they should not do that. This, I mean, the, what they usually do 
If you notice, when you go car park, where are the signs now? Outside the car park, when you come in, there are actually signs, you know. Sometimes we just don't read, la, you know. But it's there. You don't read, it's too bad. They are there in front of you. So if you notice, next time you go to the car park, you look. Alright, where are the signs? The signs are usually when you are entering. Alright, when your when it activates your when it senses your IU. Yeah, you don't look too bad lah, but it's there. All the terms will be there, boom 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 boom. Right, right and left and what what not. Even it's a small board, maybe on the box or something. Of course must be plain view, can be seen. Cannot be hidden. Hidden then also doesn't not effective. Okay, so then that we can say that you have notice of the exclusion or exemption clause. You have notice at the point of forming the contract. Okay, so that's a critical time. Alright, so if you knew there was writing, knew or believed that the writing contained conditions, there is bound by the conditions. Right. Likewise, if you knew there was writing on the ticket but did not know or believe that the writing contained conditions, nevertheless he would be bound. If the delivering of the ticket to him is such a manner that he could see there was writing upon it, has, was reasonable notice that the writing contained conditions. Okay, so the question, it's always a question of fact. Right? When was the notice of this exclusion clause given to the other party? When? Right, if it's has always has to be before or at the time of formation of contract. If after, then it's not effective. It's not effective at all. Okay, so sometimes though you may have right, you may sign something and then sometimes you will come to or there's you know, the usual thing la, like sometimes you go to you buy buy stuff, right? At a at a at a store. Right, and you go, you go to the counter, and the counter has this thing that says, "Good so not returnable." Effective or not? Is that effective exclusion clause? Huh? Yes or no? Why no? Huh? No, no. No, the, the, okay, you must go and think of your formation of contract. When is the contract formed in a store? When? When you pay, right? When you pay, remember? Because everywhere else in the store is from uh, invitation to treat. Okay, so don't forget. So that actually when you are going to the cashier there, right, then you're, that's the, you are making the offer. You are saying, I want to buy. And then they say, okay, you know, we, okay, I, we agree. And then, if at the counter there's a notice there, you are bound. Because you have seen, the notice can be seen and you've seen it. And you know it's not. But if there's no notice there, and the notice is all over the place elsewhere, ah, then maybe a problem. You can say, you know, I never see, I only saw it after I bought. Ah. Yeah. So then question mark. What do you think? Effective or not? If it's on the receipt, how do they inform you? Verbally? Okay, if they tell you verbally is a different thing. But if they don't say any verbally, and when you you pay and then you get the ticket or you get a receipt, then you see it. Is that effective? What do you think based on this principle? No. Why no? Because it's after, yeah. Okay? So you pay I risk, right? Because the receipt itself is is it doesn't make any difference to the contract, right? Whether or not he give you a receipt, it doesn't change the fact that you have paid. Right? Just if you if I don't give you a receipt, does it mean that you have not been paid? No. Okay? So the receipt is just a record. But if you put a a, a so called exclusion clause that's supposed to be binding between you on the receipt is actually post contract. Because your contract is just simply I buy, right, I pay you and you give me the goods. The receipt is not part of the contract technically. Receipt is just a record. Nee. Right? So if you're trying to put you know your exclusion cost there, it's not effective. Yeah. 
Yeah. No. No. The receipt comes after you pay. See, the already collected payment, you credit the good. It's actually not essential to the transaction. The receipt is not essential to the transaction. So, based on this argument, this principle, there is no, is no notice. The notice is too late. But it's different, like I said, if, for example, like you say, if they tell you before, you know, while they are doing the thing, that, uh, you know, this good is not returnable. Yeah, then you are paying at the time, at the same time. Or if there's a notice on the, at the cashier's booth, and yeah, it's in plain sight, goods, you know, then that one you are bow. That you are bow. Because that's all happening at the same time. Alright, so that is actually very important. That's why, I mean, businesses, you know, they, when they are in, involved in retail, this is something they need to be aware of. That's why it's important to know the law. Okay? Okay. Alright, so where adequate notice is given is irrelevant, right, whether he, could, he does not read the document or is illiterate. <laughs> okay? So even if, let's say if it's there, and if you just happen not to see it, that's your problem. Right? If anybody, any reasonable person going to the cashier's booth would see it, right? It's not enough for you to say, but I never saw it. I never saw it. You know? You can't. Because it's in plain sight. It's plain view. Unless it's hidden somewhere that's like, oh, it's actually there. Right? Then it's like, who can see that? Right? So it's got to be a reasonable thing. Right? When, you, when you're arguing on the facts. Mm. Ah, then you can actually uh, que- query them on it. Yeah. Yeah, because it says store right twenty percent. You are entitled to a twenty percent. <laughs> unless there's yes, unless there's some kind of qualification on your twenty percent, right? Unless you, if you go closer and look at the the signboard, it says certain certain goods only or only covering kitchenware or something. Then you're like, oh, when you bought a pair of jeans, then oh, doesn't apply, okay? <laughs> yeah. So it really depends on the facts, uh, Depends on the facts. Right, so this is, is quite interesting, right? Because it's very applicable in real life. All right, so all these things, uh, notice is the most important thing. Signature is, you know, that one's obvious. Okay, then of course there's this thing about previous cause of dealing. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if um, that these two parties have been dealing with each other for some time already. Um, and it's in the, um, if earlier on the contracts had included an exclusion clause, but subsequently for some reason if they didn't have any contracts, right? They just kind of did things casually, or their their contracts did not contain. They might argue, you might argue that if if one or two instances out of twenty, the, the exclusion clause were not there, it will still apply because of cost of dealing. All right? Again. The onus is on who to prove this. The person is relying on it. Okay, so that's always much remember, right? So who's supposed to prove it? So the person who says I'm ex- my liability is exempted by this clause, he must uh, he must prove that there is a cause of dealing. Okay, so as he says, there must be consistency of a cause of conduct, and it's a consistency. Which gives rise to the implication that in similar circumstances, a similar contractual result will follow. <coughs> so this one actually goes into the area of implied term. Remember, we talked about implied terms before. So implied terms can actually come up through cause of dealing. Okay, because this is something that we have always done, right? And this is the first time we've not done it, right? So unless you can prove Unless the other, the other side can show that it was deliberately left out. We had decided to leave it out. Right? The other side may say, no, no, this is, you know, it was accidentally left out or whatever. It should be in. Okay, that would be the arguments between the two sides. Alright.
Alright, so before we go to second criteria, we are looking, we need to look at this case. La Strange and Graucop, 1934. So Mrs. L ordered a cigarette machine for her cafe. So the contract that she signed included the clause, any express or implied condition, statement or warranty is hereby excluded. Right, the clause says any express or implied condition, statement or warranty is hereby excluded. Yeah, everything is excluded. <coughs> so she says she didn't see the clause. I mean, in relation to the uh, the the fitness of the the machine, uh, they should work, uh, right? So the machine was faulty. Can she sue? Can the <coughs> Can the, the supplier say that, you know, my exclusion clause works, I'm not liable, right? as ridiculous as it sounds, right? I, I supply to you a, a coffee machine that don't work, then I tell you, if it don't work, I'm not at fault, you really pay, pay for it. Okay, it sounds ridiculous, right? But what does the law state? What's the last state? What do we what do we look what do we see already? Three rules, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Signature, right? That's why it says there the contract that she signed. So she signed the contract which said that right, that it ex, ex, uh, <coughs> all these are excluded. Right? Our liability is excluded. We have no liability. She signed it. Alright, so the law states that uh, you are bound by terms and clause of contract you sign. Alright, so so in this case in this case in this case what? In this case she had she had what? She had signed the contract. Right? In this case, she has signed a contract which included the ex- uh, included the exclusion clause, exemption clause. Therefore, therefore, she she is bound. She is bound, and she cannot sue. Okay, so this is 1934, huh? So it will not probably apply because there are a lot of other things that will happen now, all right? But this is a long time ago. Okay, <laughs> right? So because of these kind of cases, that's why you have changes in the law, right? Because it's ridiculous. So I sell you a product, I put in a contract exclusion clause, you sign it, then you take delivery, and it doesn't work, and you cannot sue. I mean, that's that's. That's tantamount to same lima, same same situation. So right, tantamount to that. When you sign what, <laughs> right? That's the argument. You sign it what? Too bad. Ha ha. Right. Right. That that's the kind of attitude. Right. Too bad. You know. You I got I got away with it kind of thing. All right. Okay. So this is actually to emphasize the point. So this case emphasizes the point about when you sign something, you are bound. Even though it contains a ridiculous clause like that, you are bound. Uh, of course, like I said, they are subject to certain qualifications nowadays, like in 2014, it's quite different. Okay, so another question here. So, Chapleton and Barry UDC. So, Chapleton saw this notice when he was hiring a deck chair, all right. So he 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 go and hire a deck chair, right? So go and sit down and relax at the beach, all right. So what it says there, 
to which was displayed a notice. So there's a notice there. Uh, Barry uh, Urban UBC, right? Barry is the place, okay? The uh, Urban District Council. So it's like a town council. Uh, cold map, higher of chairs, uh, two shillings per session of three hours, right? So you rent it for three hours. And the notice went on to state that. Okay, state, what's that? Why is that? Okay, so on the other side of the tickets, so he bought a ticket, right? But he didn't know what, or the, on the other side of the ticket, he didn't, he didn't notice that it said, available for three hours, time expires were indicated by cutoff and should be retained in short request. The council will not be liable for any accident or damage arising from the hire of the chair. And, and of course, there was an accident. Right? Probably it fell apart. He fell and he was injured. Could the exclusion cause work? So here, what is the issue we're looking at? What issue are we looking at? Huh? The notice, right? Whether he has notice of uh, whether he has notice of the cost. So what is the law? What is the law state? What's the law state? What must happen in order for the clause to be valid? In order for the clause to be valid, it must be notice of the clause will be given to the other party. That's the law. Ah, before at the at the time of contract, okay. Notice must be given, okay. In this case. What do you what is the facts here? In this case Okay, right, so there are two notices, you know. The first one is when he walked there and there was some a uh, notice that was displayed. Right? So the notice that was displayed just said higher chairs 2D per session of 3 hours. That's all. More or less, that's all I said. Okay? Then, when he gets the ticket, there's actually more notices on the other side. So, in this case, the, then the note, of course, the conditions on the other side are the exclusion clause. So we have stated the law. The law says that notice has got to be given, right? Notice of the exclusion clause will be given. So in this case, in this case what? Notice was yeah, given after. Okay? So the notice of the exclusion clause right, was, n was not given at the time of contract. Alright, was given after that, right? So he repays money, then he give him a ticket, and it's on the other side. Right? So he has actually no notice. He has only notice of the earlier one. He has notice of this only. Alright? So they kind of split the thing. I mean, why they could have just put it on the same notice, right? So if they put it on that original, that the one that's outside, then yes, he has notice of it. Right, but he sees that, only sees that, and nothing else, then goes there, pays his money, gets a ticket, he just put it in his pocket. Probably that's what happened. He didn't even look at it. Then he go and, right, or he just took it and then give it to the guy, right, and then he got his chair or whatever, okay? Okay, so the law says that um, notice was given of the exclusion clause. Second, then in this case, we are saying that he was not given notice. Therefore, huh? he is not bound by the exclusion clause and he can sue. He is not bound. Okay? Chapelton is not bound. Yeah? So the Barry UDC, the council is still liable because they don't give proper notice. 
ya. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah, you can say that um, the clause is not effective and therefore they are liable. You can say that. Yeah, that. I mean, saying the same thing, you can just say it in different way. No problem. All right. Okay, so that that is one example. Another example. Okay. All right. Then question two B. The car park. Right, so this is Thornton and Shoe Lane parking. So Thornton uh, drove into a car park, and there were signs inside the car park that excluded liability. Thornton was injured in the car park. Right, could Shoe Lane parking, that is the car park company, rely on the exclusion clause? So the signs inside the car park state exclude liability for damage to property and personal injury. Again, the law states. What's the law state? What does the law state? No, we're not looking at cause of delay. Eh? This is, this is what. This is based notice. It's still notice, right? We're still talking about notice. So, what is the law state? We start notice. Yeah, notice of the screening clause must be given, right, before or at the formation of contract. Must be given notice, okay? So in this case, when was notice given? After. Alright, so the notice, the only exclusion clause is given after the contract, so it's too late. Therefore, therefore, uh, Thornton is not bound. And, or you can say Shulin is, cannot rely, and they are liable. Cannot rely on the exclusion clause. Okay, so actually the two are the same. The two cases, right, are talking about the same thing. When is notice of the exclusion clause given? Alright, so you can see that if the exclusion clause is in a contract that is signed, it's very clear. And normally, in normal situation, nobody will be fighting over that. If those kind of cases, you will not bring to court. Because you sign. It's always those cases where you have the clauses are all over the place. There's no written contract, right? In a lot of retail kind of environment, especially, there's no real formal contract, but people are trying to throw clauses in here and there. Then it's a question of whether it's effective, right? When did you give notice? Did you give notice at the right time? Right, so for the two cases, established very clearly, right? Notice must be given before or at a time of contract. Anything after that is not valid because it's not take, not considered to be part of the contract. It's not part it's not in the contract at all. Therefore, you cannot rely. Okay? So you must think of it that way. Right? You think of it as the the, the square. So the the square or the circle is the contract terms. This one is outside. So they're trying to put inside, you know? But it's not effective because contract really close really. Cannot put in anymore. Right? You already shut it already. Close the door already. You cannot come in already. Okay? So you guys just try to think of it in very simple terms. That's all that is happening here. Contract is over already. Completed. Finished. You are not allowed to add terms to a contract by yourself unilaterally. Both parties must agree. Okay? So that's another way of looking at this principle. Is that once the contract is finalized, nobody is allowed to add clauses unless both agree. Because it's not fair, how can I just suka suka just put in the clause myself? When I, I didn't know this was part of the contract, if I known I wouldn't sign. I wouldn't agree to this. Right? So it's like if you before that you before when you see the sign before, then you can decide, oh, no liability, uh, then I I don't want to you know, I don't want to use this car park. Or I don't want to um use the deck chair or whatever. Okay? So at least you have a choice beforehand. But you can't, if you never told me that, I really went in, then you said, now then you say, hey, you no, my liability is excluded. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's not part of what I agreed. Okay? So always think of it in those terms uh, when it comes to the contract, the fairness uh, of it. Okay. 
Why is this there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so normally normally there will be a gantry like if not it's not a commercial car park. Huh? Oh, if you're talking about what? HDB, yeah? But HDB now have gantries, uh. So, okay, so you're talking about a situation where, let's say, no gantry, you go in and you... The coupon, right? Is when you go in, what? It's when you go in, that's where the contract forms. Huh? Yeah, at point of entry. It has to be. It has to be. Right, because when you are, unless you uh, come out again, uh, if you come out again, there's nothing will happen. It's usually because when you park, something happened, right? So, when you enter the contract, is when you are saying, okay, I will, I will use this car park, and I will pay for the use of this car park, right? So that's where the contract is formed. Where is the notice? At the car park itself? Mm. But I mean, is the notice at those lots which are supposed to be, because that's where it's supposed to be. You know what I mean? If those lots are only allowed for, for you mean, are you saying no heavy should, should park there? It should be at the entrance? Huh? Come in today, what? Yeah, but there's still an entrance, right? But there's still an entrance, right? Don't, I mean, it can't be whole thing is open, what? Well, anything is possible, but it depend, depends on the facts, uh, you know what I mean? But, I mean, I personally can't think of any car park which has open park anywhere, you just come in anywhere. Normally, to structure it, you need an entrance and an exit. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's logical. So I'm not quite sure what you mean. Right? So normally there's an entrance, right? And an exit. It may be the same point or maybe other different points. Right? So as long as when as long as the notices are given at point of entry, then you are the car park is safe. Because they have put enough notice there. As long as any of the notices are inside, those that are inside do not apply. That's a general rule. Because, you know, the contract is formed when you come in. Yeah? Is that clear? I guess so, if there are extra facts to that. If there are some other facts to that. I, re- I guess the argument is always about notice. La. When is the notice given? Is it effective? When it comes to exclusion clause, Right, the the if the notice is very a big part of whether it's incorporated or not. When did when was it given? Not so much when did you read or whether you read or not, but when was it given? You don't read or don't understand that's your problem. Yeah? <laughs> as long as I, as the the person relying, as long as I give you the opportunity to see. Right, so the entrance of car park has to be there, and normally they will be there lah. Because that is the... Unless, of course, if you have HDB, then sometimes HDB, they have extra things. Because if, if you are uh, uh, owner of HDB flat and you are paying for that car park, you may be bound by other things. Really. That's really over and above that. You already have another contract going on through your tenancy agreement. I mean, your lease agreement, 99-year lease agreement with HDB. So that's a different story. Eh? That may be something else. You may already have terms you are bound by. Every time you use the car park, they don't have to give notice of. If your uh, HDB owner and you're using that particular car park, you're paying for using that car park. 
season part holder and all that. Eh? So there are different terms. That one, that's a bit different. But if you are like you you, you don't own a, a, a unit in that lot in that place, you're just coming like a guest and that. Then it's different rules. Then it's contract. Okay. Of course, again, if it's HDB, there may be some things in the HDB Act that may exclude anyway. Then you're bound anyway. Yeah. If the barrier hits the car, then obviously liable. Because the, huh? the management is liable. Management is liable. Because in, in, event, in any case, right, normally I'm not liable for, for things that are in the ordinary course of events, you know. Like say, for example, somebody steals from your car or whatever sort of thing. But something like gantry, they are responsible for. That one you cannot exclude. Uh. That one difficult to exclude. Uh. Unless, again, like I said, if it's HDB and if some other thing, you know, like, L- it's, like it's like MRT or MRT, you cannot sue them. Uh. There are no liability, you know, MRT. You know the case of the Thai girl who lost her legs? No liability or MRT. MRT have no liability. Under law, okay? So that one different, really. Nothing to do with they <laughs> do all this all this argument no use really because you just go to the statute and say oh okay not liable HTV you say go to the statute not liable <laughs> ah. so that one really you really wipe out all these things really. it doesn't matter argue all you want eh? the law say cannot, I'm not liable ok alright so let's look at this one now a good questions uh, question 3 uh, Jay Spurling and Bradshaw 1956 so uh, JS stored goods in B's warehouse for many years. Alright, so this is an ongoing thing. Uh, then JS brought eight barrels of orange juice right, for him to store in the warehouse. A few days later, B gave a standard receipt to JS with an exclusion clause. A few days later. And then JS barrels were damaged. So could he be rely on exclusion clause? Could the warehouse owner say the exclusion clause is effective? What are we looking at here? Cost of dealings. Okay? Cost of dealings. So what is the law state? What's the law state? What's the law state here? What's the law state here? Hmm? What is the law state? Anyone? No, this time I'm not talking about notice anymore. We're not talking about notice. Here we are talking about uh, cost of delays, right? So, in 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 uh, the law states basically that uh, an exclusion clause or whatever clause may be implied by a cost of dealings, okay, may be implied by cost of dealings. But in this case, in fact, the cost of dealings shows that there was no exclusion clause. All right. In this case, the uh, the cost of dealing was that there was no exclusion clause, right? And then subsequently, the one party tried to insert the exclusion clause with the receipt. Never, ah, correct, yeah. There was never a practice, right, to have an exclusion clause. It was always not part of the deal. Then suddenly he introduced this exclusion clause as part of the receipt. Okay, I mean yes, you can argue about notice and whatnot, but here we're looking at that. So obviously, the the in, in this case, I mean this case, uh, like I said, the the in fact the there's you cannot imply by by I mean it's not included by cost of dealing. The cost of dealing in fact shows that there's no exclusion cost before. There was no agreement on exclusion cost, right? And in fact, if you look here, of course you can also begin the notice thing. 
because it's only a few days after they put the barrels in, then they give this notice. Right? So it's also, it's also, I mean, notice is also relevant here. Alright, so therefore they cannot rely. Okay? Pure, pure and simple. Right, so on two, on two points, right? One is cost of dealing, that shows that there's no exclusion clause. Second point is that also not, there's no notice of this. Right? They only give them the receipt f- about a few days. If, uh, yeah, a few days later, it's too late. I don't know why you can't go to court or so. It's very clear cut. No case. Okay? So just to kind of recap. Okay, we're still looking at the first criteria. So recap. First criteria, what? What's the first criteria? Must be part of the contract. Alright, so some of the ways in which it can be part of the contract relates to first signature. Alright, whether the contract was, the term is in a contract document that is signed by both parties. If it is, end of story. No argument already. Right, you're bound. Secondly, and this is, as you can see, this is actually the biggest issue. Notice. Notice is the main issue. Right? It's whether, right, the party relying on the one has given the other party notice of the exclusion cost. And finally, this question of whether there's a previous cause of dealing relating to this exclusion cost. Do they have, do they have this previous, previously? If not, then question mark. Of course, you assume that you don't, you, have, you don't have one, you don't have a signed agreement. Right? So once you don't have a signed agreement, you've got to start looking at the other two. You have a signed agreement, end of story. Right? So if no signed agreement, then you start looking, is there notice? Is there previous cause of dealing? Right? So that, that is, should be your order of examination of this issue. First you look, is there a signed document? Do I have? Then, is there notice? Was that notice given? Right? Or is there a previous cause of dealing? Mm. Okay. And then he sign. Then he sign. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> you never read. Who wants you not to read? Okay, yes, it's true. The guy will be sticky. He'll go and just insert it in and then never tell. Alright, so that's, that's even worse, right? So that, or he may even say, Yeah, same. Uh. Huh? But it's still your responsibility to read. Right? You don't have to trust the other person, what? Right? Why should you be excused for being a uh, trusting? Uh, sorry to say that. You still need to check, right? And then say, hey, what's this? I don't do, I don't do business with you anymore. Right? Right? It's even worse you sign and the guy laugh at you. Ha ha. Okay? Yeah, sad to say, but that is true. That is very true. Once you have signed, like that, that case, the strange, right? Once you have signed, you are bound. You cannot, it's not, uh, it's not a good excuse to say I never read, no? No, you be thrown out of court. You never read. Let's do ask you to sign. Right? Read before signing. Okay? So always I tell you that same thing also. Read before signing. Don't understand, don't sign. No, no choice. Hmm. But that one maybe got got, got case lah. <laughs> Some to raise, uh. or even the simlim. Uh. Simlim is a classic example, right? They just give it to you a lot of words there, and the tourists cannot read. Don't know why it is. Uh, yeah, it's maybe just part of the just sign, or it's just maybe he's telling him also. They're telling him also nonsense, no? Oh, this is just one thing. I need to read, lah. Uh, uh, uh. Sign. Then you're bound, you know. You're bound. Okay, so must be careful. You're bound. You're still bound. Yeah. Yeah. 
but still bound. Ah, yeah, la, so that, that's a different story, la, right? Whether or not. But, you know, we, we don't have that kind of consumer legislation in Singapore. We don't have. We just have case. Case and case does not have any power. Right? All they can do is just, I want you, ah. Uh, don't do it again, ah. Uh. That's all they can do, what? Uh. They all um, big noise only. Or I uh, blacklist you. Or STB put you on the blacklisted list. You're assuming that the tourists even re- look at the list. Right? The tourists say, no, they will ask people, where to go, I'll ask him, okay, go. Right? And then they don't even know who is who. Right? Sorry? Lemon law, um, the lemon law doesn't cover this situation. Because the, 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 let me not cover a situation where the product is not working. This one, the iPhone is perfectly good, you know. It's just that he's overpaid for it. You know what I mean? It's totally different. He's got cheated. The iPhone is worth a certain amount. He thinks he's getting it cheap. Right? Let's say he's getting it slightly less. He gave him $100 less. But then he's signing a warranty for $1,000 over dollars or $2,000. It's overpayment. But it's not lemon law. Lemon law is just that, okay, I say something it doesn't work. Then you, you, you cannot say, okay, that's where the goods not returnable may apply kind of thing. The lemon law. If it doesn't work at all, I can return what? I pay you $1,000 for this iPhone. How can it not work? That is where lemon law comes in. It's in relation to whether the phone works or not. Not a question of how much you paid for it. So the similar case is overpayment. You're overpaying it, see? So that one, lemon law don't cover. But he's not, he's, he's not a question of not happy with the product, right? His case is that he has overpaid for the product. He's paying, it's like suddenly he's, he, he signed the thing and the guy said, okay, now pay me 1005 And then he's like, what? Why, why, why must I pay you? You sign what? That's why he started freaking out. Mm. No. Yeah. As long as you say. Right, so if you don't understand it, make sure somebody explain to you that you trust. Seriously, what? Then what you say? Yeah. Huh? Of course, the shop owner explain, right, but there's, but there's still, the Lestrange will still apply. Right, okay, so. Did, did you all do non-S nos, non factum already? Non-S factum? Oh yeah. So non-S factum is that the only way it applies is that you don't even know what it's for. Right? It means you're signing, uh, actually you're, you're signing a sale of property but you thought it's something else. You think you're signing a will, you're signing a sale of property, then that applies. Is, that means you are totally mistaken about what the document is about. Alright, so but this guy is saying, okay, sign it, this is the warranty. It's true, what? It's a warranty, but it's just the amount. Well, either they didn't see the amount, or it was obscure, or didn't understand the amount. Right? It's true, it's still a warranty agreement. So he's not lying about that. Right? So it's, just, it's a warranty agreement signed, but a warranty you have to pay how much? Unreasonable amount, see? So normally, like the Apple Care is how much? Or well, three hundred plus only, right? For let's say three, three, for three years they give you three hundred, right? But this one is like thousand over dollars. Obviously, it's ridiculous, right? Go Apple Store, lah, right? We all go to this place, right? But in that sense, he's not lying. You see, he just it's just about the sum. You know what I mean? It's still a warranty agreement. That's correct, what? It's just that the sum is, is off, that's all. Okay? So, lemon law don't apply. <coughs> correct, la. So, so, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Correct, la. So, I mean, we don't really know what the guy said to him. Right? But, obviously, he was quite gullible, la to sign it. That's why you can understand why case or the authorities cannot really come in. Because if you look at it, it's actually everything is legal. Everything seems above board. Right? Of course we know that there are some underhanded things going on. But from a very 
legal perspective, it's very difficult to do anything because they have not broken any law. They have not broken any law. So that's why nobody can take action against them. They have not taken any, uh, they have not broken any law. Okay? So, you know, unless they, they, they come up with some law to say, you know, overcharging, it's, it's not possible. It's, how can you <laughs> have a law against overcharging? Everybody does it. Then charging, overcharge by how much? Right? Then everybody can now say, hey, I went to this shop and they charge 10 cents less. So you are committed offense, right? You see, you see what I mean? All right? It's very impractical to try to control. All right? So sometimes you've got to think a little bit reasonably. La. And you say, oh, blame the government for this. No, no, no the government's fault. What? what do you expect the government to do? Huh? Oh, yeah, that's different. La. Doctors and lawyers, because they are paid, they are, they are paid a lot of money. They have expertise, so there's a there's a kind of trust, or there's a special position that they occupy, huh? And it probably interests also. But this one is retail, so retail they will tend not they will tend to back up. The government don't want to interfere in retail, right? Right, normal retail market they don't want to get interfered too much. Okay, anyway, we are straying a bit, <laughs> but good discussion. Okay. Alright, so let's take a look at the next rule. So that's the first one. The first one is, uh, must be part of the contract. Right, so rule number two, the clause must clearly exclude. So that means the clause itself must be very clear. Clearly states that the liability is excluded or limited or whatnot. It must be very clear. Alright, so here we look at this thing called contra preferentum rule. Okay, so this is a Latin phrase. You go back to 8104. Alright, so contra preferentum rule basically is very simple. I put it in simple terms for you. Right, if I rely on a cause and I'm the one who drafted it, right, if it's unclear, then the, 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 the meaning that is against me will be used. Because it's unclear. Ambiguous. I draft it. Right? If you draft it, then you will make, make sure it's clear. And you are relying on it. Alright? So, that's a simple explanation. Alright? Okay, it says there, the ambiguity should be resolved against the party who inserted and relies on it. Alright? So, if, there, if it's capable of two meanings, if a clause is capable of two meanings, that means it's ambiguous, it has two meanings, possible, two possible meanings, then the meaning that is against the person who drafted it will be used. Okay, so this is a very, 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 it's a very interesting rule. Contra preferentum. Right, if you draft it and it's not clear, then you suffer. Because you, you drafted it or what? and you are relying on it, then you must make sure that it is very, very clear. Okay? Uh, Alright, so halfway, in the, somewhere in the middle there, halfway. Clear words must be used if one party is to be excused from the results of his negligence. Okay? So this is actually to be very, very fair. Right? Because justice determines that if you want to be excused from your own negligence or default after causing somebody damage, then your clause will better be 100% clear. It's pure and simple as that. If your clause is not clear in any small way, the court will hold it against you. Because you are coming to court saying, yeah, 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 I was negligent. Yes, 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 I caused the damage. But I have this clause inside, you know. Excuse me. Ha, ha, ha. Right, then you got to make sure it's very clear. Right, because the courts don't like it in the first place. They don't like people trying to exclude like, liability, but they have no choice if it's clear. So they, they will whack on. They will definitely whack you if it's not clear. Alright, so you must also understand the thinking behind this rule. And it's quite fair. It's a very fair rule. Right, so it applies to a, a lot of things. Right, so this thing about drafting. Right, so this is where the pressure is on the lawyers to make sure that they're uh, so that's why it's always get the lawyer to draft la. Don't get at least you can sue the lawyer. Right? You draft in house or you draft yourself, cannot sue yourself. Okay, so even sometimes lawyers, right? 
when they are drafting important documents for themselves, they will get somebody else to draft for them. Why? Because they cannot sue themselves if there is a mistake. We can sue the other guy. So at least if you lose money because of his mistake, you can still sue him. Okay? So very practical. Okay, so as it says there, if there is any doubt as to the meaning and scope of the exclusion clause, the ambiguity should be resolved against the party who inserted and relies on it. Okay, so like I said, simple, simple meaning is you rely, you draft. If there are two meanings, the meaning that is against you will be the meaning, will be the one used. Alright, so it's against you. Alright, pure and simple. Okay. Alright, so then we have this one which illustrates. So Houghton and Trafalgar Insurance. So Houghton claimed insurance for vehicle accident. So Trafalgar is an insurance company had an exclusion clause that it would not be liable if the vehicle carried an excess load. Houghton was carrying six people in a five-seater car. Could Trafalgar use the exclusion clause? Yeah, it's ambiguous, right? Excess load means what? How heavy, exactly? Is one person too heavy? How, how heavy is that person? Is, what is the... There's no, sta- there's, no, there's no statement also of what is the maximum load. <laughs> it doesn't say it's ambiguous. Alright, so again... The law states that what? What's the law state? <laughs> contra preferentum rule. Right? So contra preferentum rule provides that if there's ambiguity in the exclusion clause, that ambiguity will be held against the person relying or drafted and relying on the clause. So that's the law. So in this case, in this case what? As the exclusion clause sought to be relied on is ambiguous, right? the ambiguity will be held against Trafalgar Insurance. Okay, so there's no clear way to know whether excess load means 6% in the 5 in the car. You know, how's that excess load? What if they're all children? Right? So that alone in itself is not good enough. So therefore, Trafalgar cannot rely on the exclusion clause. And, and in any case, right, if you think about it, six person in a five seater, doesn't sound like excess, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I think of excess, I think like 20 people. Right? You know? You're like a normal six, five seater car, you put 20 people, that sounds like excess. Right? So it's not clear. What do you mean by excess? Six people? Eight? Ten? Twelve? Right? So it's very ambiguous. So, if that's the case, so if you can mean, you can mean six people or you can mean 20 people, that means here I will take 20 people. Because it's ambiguous. You understand how it works? Right? Because you can mean 6 in 5, you can also mean 20. So because you can mean 20, I say 20. So there is a help against you. So I'll, say, I'll, I'll take it to be 20. Since there's only 6, then it's okay. The ambiguity is held against you. So your exclusion clause doesn't apply in this case. Alright? So that's why it's very important that these exclusion clause must be very, very clear. Very clear. Okay, excess load. <laughs> Too nice the car look is also. Okay. Okay, let's go next one. Alright, so finally, third rule. The clause must not contravene Unfair Contract Terms Act. Alright, so 
as you know, or you, you may not know, as the case may be, uh, there are a lot of acts which imply terms into contracts. Right? So, for example, sale of goods act, very important act. So, it basically covers all your retail transactions. Right? So, there are some uh, implied terms there which will be implied into the contracts. For example, seller has good title. Right? What that means is that if I sell you something, I am able to pass you the title to that, right? So I don't sell you a product and then later on someone say, that's mine, you know? That's not his to sell. Go and go and take it back. Then you can sue the, <laughs> sue the seller. Because the seller, right, it's an implied term that he is the owner. He has a good title, okay? So if somebody else kind of come and say, it is actually mine. This fellow stole it from me. Goods will conform the description or sample. So, if it's a washing machine, what should it be able to do? Wash your clothes. So, if you cannot wash your clothes, then it does not conform with description or sample, and you can return it. Okay, so anytime you wash it, it becomes more dirty. Right? Obviously, you can reject, even though there's no term inside, in black term. Good, uh, goods should be of satisfactory quality and fit for a particular purpose. Okay, so all these are basically standard implied terms, right? That are implied by the Sale of Goods Act. All right, then, since these are implied terms, we already learned that express terms can override implied terms. So what if we have, right? You guy who sells you the washing machine gives you a contract to sign. The contract says all implied terms are excluded. All implied terms are excluded. Right? So that's why the question is this. Can these uh, implied terms, implied by law, be overridden by an express term? So can you have an express term, a contract which you sign, that says, you know, all these implied terms, excluded, don't apply. Okay, so this is where unfair contract terms comes in. Alright, so effectively, some examples. Section 2.1 is a very, very, very important one. You cannot exclude liability in negligence for personal injury or death. Cannot. You'll always be liable, even if you have signed a contract, right, which says that Okay, right, you want to travel on this cruise ship, right? You sign a contract to travel in this cruise ship for three weeks, and in the contract it says, you die, I'm not, I'm not liable. You injured during the cruise, not liable. This clause makes that clause inapplicable. So if something does happen to you, you can still sue the cruise company, even though you sign a contract which says you can't. Understand? So that's why it's a very important uh, important act, unfair. So they're basically saying that these terms are unfair because they must, you must always be liable in negligence for personal injury or death. You cannot exclude liability for that. Right? Because if you do that, then you really don't care, right? <laughs> if you're allowed to do that, then you won't care about people's safety, won't care about security and all these things. Cannot be. That one cannot be. That was against public interest. Section 6.1. Alright, this one, important. Cannot exclude the implied term the seller has good title. So, and also, if the buyer is a consumer, that means as opposed to a business, huh? if business is a different name, but as a consumer, that means you and I going to a retail store. You cannot exclude the implied terms, those three. Description, sample, satisfactory, okay? So cannot. Alright, so can these terms be overridden? Cannot. Can these implied terms be overridden? Based on what you just read? Yes or no? No, you can't. Because you have this uh, statute called Unfair Contracts Terms Act. Okay? So, you cannot put into a, co you can, you put in a contract, so no use, like, it's not worth the paper, it's written on. So you have an express term that says, all implied terms are excluded. It's not effective, 
with respect to this. Alright, so, but those that are covered by this cannot be excluded. So you may exclude some others, but these you cannot exclude. Alright, but these exclusions are allowed. So there are some that are allowed, if reasonable. For example, Section 2.2, you can exclude liability in negligence for other kinds of loss. Right? Other kinds of loss that are not death or injury. That means property damage can. Or loss of property. Loss of money, economic loss, so can. But not when it involves the person. Death or injury. Cannot. Section 6.3 If the buyer is a non-consumer, that means a business, you can exclude. Okay. Why? Why is there a difference for consumer, non-consumer? Huh? Yes, better bargaining power and also you assume that you will have some legal advice and all those things. Right? When you are negotiating contracts. Right, you will have. That means you go in with your eyes open. You include. Uh, okay, can the consumer usually less protected, and the bargaining power is not so great compared to a big store, and and, and you. Okay, so that's what they are looking at. All right, that's it for tonight. <laughs> End of e-learning lecture. Submit your answers. No, no. no. I'm your E E lecturer today. I'm your E lecturer. Okay, so that's basically it for today. Any questions? Okay, so this is very specific. Alright, so recap. Alright, so you quickly recap. Just hmm? Monday. It'll be Ben at the back of the same class. Okay, then the f- following week will be Tuesday. The following, the 25th is Tuesday, and it will be me. Right back in the classroom on the other side. Then from then on, it will be Tuesday, and it will be me. Huh? Huh. Why is it not? Because you can access it online. Singapore statutes. Singapore statutes, yeah. It's quite clear, lah. It's quite clear, yeah. Singapore statutes, anybody can access. Okay, so nowadays it's always like no excuse. I said in the old days, you gotta buy, yeah. In the old, day, old, old days, yeah. You have to buy. Then whenever, whenever they have amendment act, then you got cut and paste, no? Wow, they cheer like crazy. Right, now, now, Everything online. The last time you don't know, hey, did I cut and paste properly? Are you reading the right one? So that was quite scary, you know. I think you find out I'm reading the wrong act. Die. <laughs> that was really, that was really panic. <laughs> but now you just go to the act. Even though, right, strictly speaking, if the, the law is wrong on the act, you they are not liable. Okay? So, so you go and check. They have some exclusion clauses there as so. So the question is, are they effective? Right? If they had put, let's say they put something in the law that is incorrect. They didn't update in time, for example. They say they are not liable. You still have to do a verification and confirmation. Uh. So, again, is okay, wait, before you go, before you go, let's just, let's just recap. Okay, so there are three rules for exclusion clause. First, criteria must be part of the contract that we say. Right, and then the notice of exclusion cost is very important. Second criteria, right, it must clearly exclude the liability. So here is where your contra preferentum rule. Right, so simply put ambiguity. If there's ambiguity, ambiguity will be interpreted against the person who is relying on the cost. And finally, that's why it says here, it must not contravene UCTA. That means it must comply with UCTA. So if UCTA says that you can't have exclusion cost for liabil- uh, liability negligence for death or personal injury, you put that in, it won't be effective. So it doesn't matter if you have one on two. Right? So you might have it, the, your exclusion cost for this, 
like let's say exclusion against liability for death may be part of the contract. It may be given, it may be very clear, right? If you die, I'm not liable, it's very clear, <laughs> but still cannot. Okay? So you must have all three. Two out of three, no. It still won't work. Right? So this is the final test. It does it contravene UCT? Does it contravene? Then you can say, okay. Alright, so I'll see you in two weeks' time, but next week you see Ben on Monday. Alright, good night.